Good morning, everyone. Um, I think it's just about time for us to go ahead and make a start. Um, I wonder if I could just first check that you can see my screen displayed OK? A little nod or thumbs up from somebody? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. So um, welcome um, to Step Change in Safety's um, second in our series of Human Factors webinars. Um, today we're looking at Human Factors in Accident Investigation. So a relatively um, brief webinar this morning, so just an hour. Um, we will try to have some time at the end for questions, but if you um, have any questions afterwards or we can't fit in all the questions within our allotted time, um, feel free to contact us afterwards and we will really responses back to you. So um, if I could just request that all participants make sure that their mic is muted, um, that your cameras are off just for um, everybody's um, quality of line and a reminder that this session is being recorded and will be posted on our website at a later date. Um, the slides um, I believe will also be available to attendees. So um, just a brief outline. Um, I am Carolyn Smith from Step Change and Safety, um, just facilitating the session today. Um, our key speaker is David Jameson, um, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Then um, we'll have a, a brief uh, moment for Q&A, closing comments, and then round it up by 10 o'clock. So just to introduce our speaker, um, David Jameson is a Human Factors Lead at Shell, a char chartered member of the Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors and has 23 years of experience working in Human Factors, firstly in consultancy and for the last, last 12 years with Shell Upstream UK. While at Shell, David has developed a strategy and become responsible for the Human Factors programme of work for the business, including safety critical task analysis, human factors input into investigations, organisational change, human factors in projects and human factors assurance. David has been involved in Step Change and Safety Human Factors work group since around 2015, in which time he has been working with the team to actively promote best human factors practice in a way which will provide real practical value to Step Change and Safety company members. So thank you very much for agreeing to present for us today, um, David, and we will just make a start. OK, thanks. Thanks very much, Carolyn. Um, so, yeah, that's my uh, my intro um, there. I can't really add add much to that. But good morning, um, and thanks to everybody for for joining. I hope you can hear me and see me okay. Uh, the lighting here seems to go seems to go up and down a bit. But anyway, um, so what I'm going to take you through this morning is um, yeah. So it's human factors in incident investigations. Um, and so it's drawn from my own experience and also how we do it in Shell. Um, so of course this is going to vary from company to company, but I think there's a lot of underlying principles that um, that are the same. So we'll go through a bit of the theory and then I'm going to give you a practical example of how we do it in Shell. And um, we'll also talk a bit about how the, the culture um, that we have and the biases that we have can have a, a very strong um, impact on what we get out of an investigation. And um, so that's that's the, the the other piece that we'll cover. Um, I am going to so so usually when I do this, it's it's fairly interactive. Um, now, I know that in this um, uh, format, then, you know, that's that's limited to an extent, but I am going to try and make it a little bit interactive. Um, so I'm going to throw, throw some questions in as we go and I'm just going to open it to the floor and and, and um, so yeah please um, feel that you can come off mute and and shout shout some answers when we when we get to those bits. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to start with uh, human error um, so this is something that's um, yeah quite quite so central to the idea of human factors in incident investigations. Um, oh, can you take that away again? Sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks. 
So that so um I just want to start by by asking um when we talk about human error, what does that mean to people? What do people understand of human error? What do you think a human error is? Could could we have a few a few ideas, a few shout outs? A mistake, a slip or a lapse, David. Yep. Yeah. Very good. OK, mistake, slip or lapse. Anything else? Any time the outcome is other than intended. Yeah, so something about intention, unintended outcome. Yeah, good. Any more? Misjudgment. Misjudgment, yeah. Also good. Unintentional. Unintentional, yeah, certainly. One more. We just have the comments. Oh, we've got comments going as well. Can I see? Sorry, no, no, it's OK. I'll read them to you. Um, Just in the chat, we have faults and unsafe acts. OK, stupid deeds. <laughs> um, unsafe acts, faults. Yeah, so yeah, t typically, and we, and we can look at what's on the slide now. Carolyn, thanks. Yeah, I don't have any more slides like that. I don't think so. I don't think we're going to get caught out again. Um, uh, so typically, yeah, the, the, the sort of things that you've called out there, um, when you ask people, you know, what is what is a human error, that typically what you would hear, and, and that, you know, it, it's it's fair comment. Um, so there's certainly a thing about intention where you, you fail to produce the, the expected or the intended outcome. Um, there are different types of errors, and we've got some of those, so a mistake, how we define a mistake is different to how we define a slip or a lapse. Um, misjudgment um, is, is in there. Um, and um, yeah, so, so what you're seeing there on the slide is, is what we was generally agreed when we talk about human error. And these things are certainly rooted in mental processes. So we're interested in what's going wrong in terms of our mental processes when we think about error. But one one kind of um, thing to say about about error, and I, I thought it was kind of captured in the in the middle statement there, which is in italics. So that's lifted from a, that's a quote that I found. Um, there's a chap called Steve Shorrux, who's quite um, to the fore in, in human factors. Um, you would find him online. Um, so that's that's a quote from from a piece that he wrote. Um, someone did or did not do something they were not or were supposed to do according to someone. So the point he's making there is that actually to try and define a human error, it's quite an elusive thing. Um, you might think we understand what human error is, but to try and find a definition for it that we all agree on is is quite a difficult quite a difficult thing to do. Um, so if we can move to the next slide. Yeah, so so where does this leave us in terms of how do we think about error when, when we're doing an investigation? Um, so the first point there is, is the one I've just made that there is no <clears throat> there is no agreed definition. Um, so we may use a particular definition or we may use, you know, our own idea of what an error is or, or maybe even our company's definition of what an error is but that's that's not something that's that's universal so we should we should bear that in mind different people will have different ideas about what an error is or what it isn't um the other um or another thing about error that can be limiting in in an investigation is that it can be a stopping point in, in explaining cause um and so this is this is the the uh, the situation where we we um, we hear and um, the cause was human error. So in human factors, we would say that the cause is never human error. Um, error is just the starting point. We have to understand why the error happened. So we can't say it was the cause. What we're interested in is what caused caused the error. Um, so that's something else to watch out for. And the other, and this is a big one in investigations, the other thing about error is that in investigations, it is, of course, um, a judgment we're making a judgment on somebody's behavior that's after the fact um so it's it's um it's with hindsight 
So when we're in possession of all the facts, when we've done the investigation, then we make a judgment on the behaviour and we say, oh, well, well, it was an error. But of course, the person at the time um, had best intentions and, and didn't have the information that we that we now have. Um, so so it, it can be problematic in, in, in that sense. Um, and the other point here is that it's strongly influenced by by the outcome. So what I mean here is that, um, and, and this has been studied um, in, in psychology, um, we can basically look at the same action. So we can present the same action um, to, to a, a group or a panel. Um, and in one case, we can um, say that, that led to a negative outcome. And in the other case, it doesn't lead to a negative outcome. And that action is judged more negatively or more severely when there's been a negative outcome, which doesn't really make sense when it's the same action. It either is an error or it isn't an error. You know, it is the right thing to do or it isn't. But we tend to judge it based on what the outcome was. If there was no, if there was no um, negative consequence, then we think the action was okay. Um, so again, something we need to we need to watch out for. So, so the key the key points here, and and this is this is how we we try to um, sort of deal with error in investigations. Um, we don't we don't categorise um, in the analysis. So when you're doing the sort of discovery. Um, we're not saying, right, that's an error, let's analyse it. But instead we're saying, here's a behaviour or an action we're interested in, let's not judge it, but let's just do a piece of analysis to try and understand why why that happened. Um, it must only be the starting point. So as I said before, um, an error is never a cause. We need to understand why why the error happened and, and dig, dig deeper. Um, and we should remember that when we're judging, um, if we if we do try to make a judgment as to whether something's an error or not, then that's been influenced by hindsight and it's been influ influenced by by biases that we have. Um, so we might be judging behaviour more harshly and um, with hindsight than, than than we would if we had been there at, at the time. So we'll speak more about hindsight and biases um, in in later slides. OK, so <clears throat> how then do we yeah, understand human behaviour as, as part of an investigation? Um, so in Shell, we have a sort of a two a two pronged approach. So we use something that we call the human behaviour model. And we'll look at that um, on the next slide. And then we apply um, systems thinking and we look at performance influence and factors that could have um, had an effect. Um, and we'll we'll look at the theory behind that um, as as we as we go. Um, so let's just dive into each of these. So the human behaviour model um, you see here. So this is this is not something that Shell invented. I mean, it's not this is not something that belongs to Shell. This you would find this. So um, this actually comes from theory by a chap called Wickens, which was back in the 19, I think it was in the 1980s. And you'll see similar um, kind of models <clears throat> in psychology. So it's all about information processing um, where you're trying to understand an action. So you, you have an action um, towards the right hand side there in the yellow box and you have an outcome and you have a goal. But what you want to understand is <clears throat> on the left hand side, what was the, the information that was available to the individual? And that could be in terms of um, what they could see, what they could hear, and um, it could be written, it could be um, it, it, it could be something to do with the, the, the design um, and how that looked. Um, it could be something that was said to them. So, so, but it, taken together, you know, what what was the what was the the, the information inputted to that that action or that decision? Um, and then we're we're then in the blue. These are these are about the internal processes, really the internal mental processes. So how is the information perceived? Um, so just because of the information's there doesn't mean it's even seen to start off with. And then if it is seen, it depends on how it's interpreted. So how is it perceived? What role did memory play? Um, the reasoning side of, of thinking. So was there any conscious problem solving that went on? 
Um, where was the focus of attention? Because often in tasks that's divided. Um, and so where, where was the attention at the time? And then what knowledge, what experience did the individual have that they, they brought to bear in, in, that, in that situation? Um, so by working through that little model there, then it, it helps us to see where thinking or internal processing has influenced the, the action. And it lets us start to look at where there might have been a breakdown in those in that internal thinking, um, which which led us to our, our action, which led us to our undesirable outcome. Um, so that's the first thing we would look at. Um, we would then move on to this this piece here. So so this is this is systems thinking. So this is this is just fundamental to human factors. Again, this is not a, a you know piece of shell theory. This is just um, fundamental and you would see you would see that something so the drawing that you see here you would see something similar if you looked if you looked you know anywhere really um, so I, again I just want to open this up and, and just ask the question so when I'm talking about a system and when in human factors we talk about a system what do we actually mean by a system what does that mean to people can you give me some some thoughts on that A, a process or a way of doing things? Yeah, certainly could be. Everything that plays a part in the way that the work gets done. Yes. The socio-technical system, the people, plant and process. Yeah. People, plant, process, yeah, that's good, yeah. A few comments here, a process. A series of actions, a socio-technical system, a toolbox we can use. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's good. So the um, the, the the drawing there tries to um, encapsulate everything. Um, so basically, the, the the system. I mean, as one person said, there is everything that plays a part in 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 how work is done, and that's kind of where it is, you know, it, it's, um, if you think about the, on the drawing there, so you've got the individual person, the, the person, the worker, somebody doing a task in the, in the middle of this model, and then round about are the various different factors that can influence and um, what, what they do. And these are, these can be grouped. These are typically grouped or categorized in different ways. And some of the things you, you, you mentioned there, uh, so people process plant that's one way of categorizing or grouping i'm just showing it done slightly differently so it's about the environment the, the tools and equipment they use the management systems that they have to use and and the actual design of the task and everything is influenced by the organization and and its processes and its and its people and and its culture and um, so there's a whole load of things that that um, are having a having an influence on um, an individual and, and what they do, and it and it's fundamental to human factors. What what we're interested in is the interactions between these different factors and how they have an influence. So on the Venn diagram there, it's it's the the little kind of intersections or the, the different sh shaded areas is, is where factors are are interacting, and that's what we're interested in. So it was that individual with that experience carrying out that task in that area at that time with that piece of kit following that procedure and 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 those factors came together and and that context created a, a behavior or, or an action so an incident investigation that's what we need to dig into we need to be um looking at these interactions and um and figuring out you know where where these influences um, came from. So these factors are generally known as performance influencing factors or, or PIFs. You might see performance shaping factors. You might see some slightly different bits. Same same idea. Um, and and there's lots of these. So I think if we look at the next slide, yeah. So you can't you can't read that, but it was that that's just. 
that's the the set of performance influencing factors that we use um and and again you can group them in slightly different ways but you can see that the sheer number of these um and so you would you, you wouldn't never be able to consider you know each one each time but these are just there as as prompts the sort the, the kind of things that can influence what people do so you've got um individual um factors competence um teamwork factors communications within the team design factors design of equipment design of the task supervisory and management factors so what role did the supervisor play what information did they provide what guidance did they provide how often were they you know um actually looking at the job uh, and then the organizational factors are kind of everything else um resourcing um how responsibilities are structured um processes i mean so you know management of change permit to work um there's there's, there's so many um so these are, are things that um we need to um be looking for um again when we're doing an investigation um to, to understand uh, actions and behaviors okay moving on so it's just a little summary then of that piece so so it's these performance influence and factors that determine what people do and it's the interactions between factors that we are interested in um and you could think about that as where where the interactions don't work or go wrong or there's a misfit there between you know the person and the environment or the person and the procedure or the person and the design of the, the equipment that they're using um we need to look deep and we need to look into the wider system to properly understand um why people do what they do and there's always multiple factors so we shouldn't think that we're looking for one um underlying cause you know we shouldn't ask what was the underlying cause I mean, there's never just one underlying cause um hopefully you can see from the from the system model that there's going to be a number of different factors that interacted and came together and created you know the the, the incident um, ultimately so we need to we're looking at a number of different things here to explain what happened there's never just one um okay so that's that's the theory part uh this is just a little bit more theory, I guess, and then we're, then we're going to go into the, the practical example. Um, so, so in Shell, we use an approach that we call causal learning. Um, again, you could look in the literature and find something very similar, but we've just kind of taken that and given it a name and and um, written a written a sort of a, a a process for it, and and that and that's what we use. So in causal learning, the fundamental part of it is the the thinking that you use, the reasoning that you use when you when you're doing it, um, and it's all about what did happen, what actually happened, um, and and why why did an action make sense at, at the time? Now that's easy to say, um, but we find that it's actually very difficult for people it can be very difficult for people to think in that way because where we tend to default to is defensive reasoning and you see this in in lots of investigations and we we, we still have it in ours as well um where the focus is on what people didn't do so people somebody did not they didn't do x y z um and, and that's why it, that's why it happened um that's not something we would we wouldn't we wouldn't look at that in um in causal in a causal analysis if it didn't happen then it didn't influence what did happen so we we, we, we don't consider it and it can be quite difficult for people to to get their, their head around that um but the 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 fundamental piece here is that somebody took an action at the time and it had to make sense to them at the time otherwise they would have done something else so, it's, so why did they do that 
and what you know what were the what were the reasons for what were the factors that influenced that decision or that action so it's not about what they didn't do or and it's not about what they should have done but at least not in the first part of the uh, analysis so solution reasoning we have to get into of course because we need solutions um but we try and hold off um on the solution reasoning until we properly understand cause because what we've found is that um if we go into solution reasoning too quickly then we come up with actions that don't address cause so that they're not going to fix anything you know they're, they're just not going to be effective so we hold off from solution reasoning until we've got got the cause we understand what did happen and why and we try to avoid this defensive reasoning um, you, sorry if i could just pause you there for a second um paul's yeah. um asking a question and it maybe links into that so do you think the language of investigation affects the process and what are your thoughts about moves towards um learning reviews or similar terminology for better engagement yeah so so la language definitely does and and, and th this is why we we try to avoid defensive uh, reasoning because the the other place that that can take you is towards blame um uh blame thinking so somebody didn't do something and they should have so you know you start you start down the road of blaming individuals um and that's not helpful to anybody um and as i say um it made sense to them at the time so so let's try and understand why it did and and they had a you know they were they were well intended you know people are trying to do a good job things go wrong um so and we'll, we'll talk a bit more about it because it, it kind of comes into biases and culture so the, the last piece um we'll probably talk a bit more about how yeah the, the the mindset that you take into an investigation and therefore the language that you use has a, has a major a major impact on, on on what you get out of it yeah okay so if we go to the next slide, yeah. So we're going to go in with our causal mindset, what did happen. And these are the at sort of a basic level. These are the questions that we that we would sort of work through. Um, so first of all, it is about actions and decisions and behaviours and judgments. And we need to decide which ones we're interested in. Um, so which ones do we think, you know, had a had a um, an impact on on what happened? um but without you know without trying to categorize those and um, without saying it was this error or that error or it was a violation or it was a, a deviation we're just trying to identify behaviors actions so we'll describe that action or decision in terms of what actually happened why did it make sense to the person at the time that's really the big the big question and then we're going to look at internal performance influencing factors, which we saw in the human behavior model, first of all. And then we're going to look at the more external system performance influencing factors, which we saw um, in the where we had all the, the, the PIF questions that you that were too small for you to read. So that's what, what we would we would work through. So I'm going to give you an incident example here to try and bring this to life and show you how this actually works for us so so this is based on a real a real incident that we had um 2000 and 2018 um so this is at our brefu bay um marine loading terminal down in fife so um we've got liquids that go from st fergus um up near peterhead um down to fife um and um the the liquids are basically um of ga gas is is cooled so we've got liquid gas which is piped um, down the jetty that you see there on the left hand side and loaded onto ships to be to be taken away um the way it's loaded onto the ships is via um these loading arms so the kind of the, the tall in the, in the middle of the ship, those sort of tall crane, crane-like structures are the loading arms, and uh, the middle picture shows you a closer view of of a loading, a loading arm, and 
the picture on the right is the um, is the connection part. So that's where the um, the loading arm connects to a flange on the ship. So that connection is made. It's a the, basically the clamps are um, it's hydraulics. The clamps are on hydraulic power, and uh, yeah, the connection is made to the flange on the ship, and then we can load. Um, we clear the arm. What once we finish loading, we clear the arm of hydrocarbons, uh, and then and then disconnect disconnect the arm, and and we're we're done. So that's that's the overall operation. Um, if you move to the next slide. Yeah, so what was relevant in this incident? So this is the controller that's used um, uh, to control the um, loading arms. Um, so you can see the joysticks, two joysticks there to move them around. Um, and there are the there are actually buttons on the side. So this is looking down on the control box. There are buttons on the side you can just see on the left hand side, maybe it says close coupler, open coupler. So there's two buttons on the side for opening the opening the, the or closing the coupler. And the dial, so bottom right, um, where it's got loading arm at the bottom and then X3501, X3502, X3503, X3504. So that's for selecting the loading arm that you want to that you want to use. So there are four, and as you can see there, it's set to, to number one. Um, so that gives you just a high level overview. Um, so on the next slide, yeah, so we'll now talk about what went wrong. So, so basically what happened here is that we, we'd finished loading. Um, so two, two loading arms are, are connected. And we'd finished loading. Uh, and we were, so what we had to do is basically clear the hydrocarbons from each of the two arms and, and disconnect them. So one at a time. Uh, and then and then we're, we're pretty much done. And what happened was that we um, inadvertently released one of the loading arms before it was cleared of hydrocarbons. So there was some residual propane in there. Um, and we had a we had a propane leak. So what you see here is the from our um, uh, cause and effects um, tree or diagram, and and this this I mean whatever approach you use, you know you'll have a a tree or a diagram that lets you look at underlying causes. So you, you could imagine that um, on that tree there are certain actions or decisions that that you're interested in. So this was one for us. So um, we know that the um, so loading arm one was released and that resulted in a propane leak. And then below there are two causes. Um, so you see that on the left, the controller was set to loading arm one and the tech pressed the open button. Um, so we wanted to then analyze, well, why did the tech press the open button at that time? Um, even though loading arm one was still filled with with uh, with hydrocarbons, so that was the action that we effectively pulled out to to do to do the um, HF HF analysis. And on the next slide, we can see what that looked like. So this is the our action in red there. Tech pressed op open button. Um, slotted into the human behavior model. And, and then the model was, was populated. So um, in terms of the, we know what the consequence was, number two. So loading arm one was was opened or released and we had a, we had a propane leak. Um, in terms of what the tech intended to do, which is in number three, the goal. So he intended to open loading arm number two that was his intention, but inadvertently opened number one. So that describes that part of it. We then work our way around to number four on the left. So what information was available to the tech at the time? Um, so basically, he had the controller in front of him. Um, 
and he was he's there on the ship you know with his supervisor and with another tech um so the information on the controller is right in front of him and any information that regards the the loading arms is right there as well because he's that's where he is um but as i said before just because information is available doesn't mean that we we see it um so his perception was so in number five his perception was that the controller was set to number two when it was in fact set to number one now you've seen the dial on the controller on the last slide small dial small tags and only one number of difference between each tag um so we'll come back to that but his perception was that he was set to two when actually he was set to one he wasn't really thinking about the position of the controller is what we found and his thinking was if i press the open button i'm going to open number two um his focus so and we we got quite a good look at this and through interviews as well his focus was more on what the team the other two people were doing and saying rather than on the control box that's what his focus was and in terms of his experience he was I mean, he'd done this a number of times, but he was technically still a trainee. So it wasn't a competence issue, but he's still becoming, I suppose, familiar with, with certain aspects of the task. So maybe he needs to spend more time listening and looking at the arms and listening to, to his supervisor. And that takes his attention away, some of his attention away from the, the controller. Um, so that lets us gives us an idea of what, what's going on in terms of his, his thinking and then around about the model so you can see PIF 1, PIF 2, PIF 3. So this is where you start to look at the using the prompts that you saw you um you start to you start to look at the these performance influence and factors um which of those could have been could have been relevant for the for this action. So we've got attention, distraction, um, as, I, as I explained, he was looking and listening more to the, his supervisor rather than the control box. It was at night time, so lower lighting. I mean, it was, you know, the, it's not that it was in darkness, but the, the lighting probably wasn't what it would have been during the day. And then design wise, um, just the fact that we've got that dial and you could be on it could be on any arm um, and the tags are small and not yeah, look very similar at, at, at quick glance and um, so these are things that are, are, are have had an influence and then what you would do is I and mean, I don't have it here but what you would do is you would dig dig deeper so you could try and go to the next level of of um, performance influence and factor so if, if it is the design if it's a design one well why do we use that design? Um, if it's an environmental one, well, why did we have to do it at that at that time of the day? Um, regards his experience, is there is there something there about how we manage, um, you know, people with with less experience on these tasks? Um, so we can dig we can dig deeper. Okay, and then and then what we have here is what it looked like when we went back into our cause and effects diagram or our causal tree or whatever you want to call it. So what we started with is the top left piece in the in the sort of darker blue. So we we had that the uh, loan arm one was released because the controller was set to one and the tech pressed the the open button, and then bottom right in the light blue. That's what we've then added from our HF analysis. Um, and I've sort of mapped that there to what we took from the human behavior model. So his perception was that he was set to two, but that the position of the controller had gone out of his mind. He was focusing on what the team were doing and saying. And why was that? Well, because he was still a trainee and uh, he, had, he had less experience. Um, so the HF analysis part on that, particular action let us then build that part of the that part of our causal causal diagram and the PIFs the PIFs can stay as PIFs so they don't become causes but they can 
they can so you, so you've almost got a cause uh, sorry a pif that's relevant to a cause so causes are necessary pifs are you know what had an influence and um, 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 made maybe made um, made something more likely but not but not necessary so pifs can stay as you see as they are there they can stay as pifs um, and we try and go as deep as we can okay hopefully then that um yeah lets you see how how it actually practically works what it, what it looks like um okay so the last piece we're going to go through now there's only i think two or three more slides um is that yeah and this is what we touched on earlier so this is this is really about how the the, the culture within your organization um will determine the the mindset that is taken into an investigation um and the mindset that that you go into an investigation with and and that will you will see that in the language that's used and and in the questions that are asked this probably has well has a bigger impact on what you get out um more so than 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 the actual methodology you use um that this is this is the big one to 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 get right um so what we have in shell is is what you see here so we have a set of what we call human performance principles and we try and use these to to govern or to yeah to 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 direct us and guide us in 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 how we how we manage and how we manage risk um and so what you see in here is um if you look at so numbers one and three we're saying we all make mistakes um everybody's trying to do a good job so that's to try and keep us away from blame culture we don't want to go in there and start pointing pointing the finger um two and four are about about systems thinking so systems influence what people do um errors are associated with or errors associated with incidents stem from underlying conditions that we can't always see so systems thinking seven eight and nine how leaders respond matters we need to learn from our mistakes we need to value the people that have been involved and we need to we need to accept that the people that do the job understand it better than anybody else and um, so if we, if we want to understand it we we really need to properly engage and, and listen to, to what what they're telling us um so this is the kind of thinking that you know we we're trying to encourage people to take into an investigation and you know not everybody it's not it's not always easy um not everybody finds it easy to go in with that kind of open mind and 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 we we still i'm not saying we're perfect at all you know we still um uh we can still struggle with, with some of these but this is at least what, you know what we're trying to how we're trying to approach um investigations okay so that's mindset specific biases yeah so again we've touched on uh we've touched on the first one um here so again the, these similar with uh, it's kind of a part of mindset i suppose that these 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 kind of a very powerful um impact on on what you get out of an investigation um so the hindsight bias so um specifically this is where we we have a tendency to overestimate what people would have known or could have known at the time or could have foreseen at the time so when we've when we're doing the investigation okay we've got time to collect information we've got time to look at the, what happened from lots of different angles and you know, speak to lots of different people about it and then we start making judgments on why people did what they did it's all with the benefit of hindsight the person there at the time didn't have that information didn't have those different angles didn't have the time that we have on an investigation and and had to make a decision and thought that was the best decision at that time and we need to understand why that is so we need to try and avoid that or limit that that hindsight bias um the middle one so the fundamental attribution error so this is about um how we explain cause or how we explain behavior and what this tells us is that when we look at somebody else's behavior 
we tend to overestimate personality factors. So it's about that individual, and that's why they did what they did. Um, and when it's our own behaviour, it flips, and we look more at external factors to explain our own behaviour. So a simple example, when, when somebody's late for a meeting, sometimes you, know, you might look at that person and go, well, they're, all, they're just a bit careless, irresponsible. Um, uh, you know, they, they, they don't, um, yeah, they don't really care about this, this meeting. Um, if it's yourself, it's never that. If it's yourself, it's because you got held up by um, somebody else. Um, you know, your boss gave you something else to do at short notice, and that's why you were late for the meeting. Um, so we should think about that. We, if, 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 we, if, if our own behaviour is because of external factors, why, why should that not be the same for other people? We should, we should give credit to, towards the external factors for why other people behave as, as they do. Um, and then a confirmation bias is one where, yeah, we, we, tend, we can tend to look for information that supports our, our own thinking or a theory that we have. We can kind of selectively look for information that supports our theory rather than being a bit more, a bit more open minded. These can be very difficult. Even when you tell, this is what they found in psychology, even when you tell people about these, it can still be very difficult for people to not kind of lapse into, into, these, into these biases. But at least if we can raise awareness of them, and I think in, in investigations, especially the first two, in my experience, then um, it, it can hopefully um, help make a difference. OK, last slide. Um, so this kind of, in a way, I use it to try and wrap, wrap everything up. Um, so I'm saying here that the, the human factors approach that we want to take into an investigation, it can be difficult. And one of the reasons for that is because there's long standing or traditional ways of thinking about safety and thinking about why people do what they do that are actually at odds with human factors thinking. So again, we'll have a quick shout out. So the terms that you see there, we you will often see these, and we we use them a lot. Um, we use them a lot in in explaining why people have done what they did. Um, so if you look at um, our investigation reports and and the way people just speak about incidents, that the, they'll use a lot of these words basically to to explain why somebody did what they did. So based on what we've been through this morning, can you tell me what issues or difficulties do you see with using terms like these to explain behaviour? It focuses too much on the individual and not on the underlying issues. Yeah, that's one. Spot on. People take it personal, don't they, when they get some negative feedback and, and feel like it's been targeted. So a lot of us are uncomfortable giving people negative feedback. Yeah. OK. So some of them state the obvious, like uh, with hindsight, you know, like lack of awareness. Well, yeah, you're going to say that after something's happened. But, yeah. Uh, at the time for the, for the people involved, the, the, they thought they were aware. Yeah, exactly. No, that that's yeah. That, are that's most of these are most of these terms actually sort of judgment calls without actually any um, um, evidence behind them? Yeah. Again, well, most of these are collective, aren't they? They're not specific to the persons or person that was involved, but also to do with the organisation, the culture. It's a lot broader than focusing in on the, and trying to identify the single root cause. Yes. Yeah, and this looks like there's a... Oh, we just, we just oh, lost you there. Sorry. But, yeah, no, you, you, you've, uh, you've, you've clearly got a good grasp of this, because uh, that, yeah, the, there's one other one which I had, which is, so you've got... Um, these focus on the individual. They don't. They don't look at system factors. 
so that's at odds with human factors. Um, they're sub subjective, they're highly subjective. I mean, how do you judge, how do you measure something like complacency or normalization? I mean, are you 50% one day and the next day you might be 75? I mean, these are just highly subjective. Um, they, they definitely um, are open to the hindsight bias. And, and the other one is they, they don't tell us anything about why. I mean, we, we might use uh, some of these terms, but we need, but, but even then we still need to know why. Why was that the case? And then these, these we, we, we often stop at these, you know, we say, oh, well, it's because they weren't competent. I mean, that it doesn't tell us anything really. Um, so good, very good. Um, and I think that's the last, the last slide. Yes, it is. So we've got seven or eight minutes um, for Q and A. So how do we do this, Carolyn? So um, if you would like to um, raise your hand or type a question into the chat area, then I will put the question to David. Um, sorry, Angela, did I see your hand up there? Do you want to go ahead and make a start? No. <laughs> um, OK, um, someone has commented that group thinking bias could be something to be aware of, too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, group, group think is something quite specific in um, psychology. Um, if, if you wanted a good, I, I always find it quite difficult to get a kind of a definition of group think. But if you wanted a good account of what it is and how it can have an impact, then um, uh, Andrew Hopkins, who wrote about the um, the Deepwater Horizon, the Macondo incident, um, he has a piece in in his book on that incident, which explains how groupthink had had a, had an impact on on what happened there. So that would give you a good a good example. Excellent. Um, we have a few questions here. Um, who carries out these investigations? Are all investigators trained, or is the HBM carried out by the human factor specialists? Yeah. So we so we have so. People get trained in uh, causal causal learning. That's the training, and part of the causal learning is is human factors. There's a human factors module, which is part of that causal learning training course. It's a five day course, um, done internally. Um, so it means then that we're not relying on just HF specialists, but the investigators have got enough, you know, enough knowledge about. HF that they can they can um, they can build it into the how they do an investigation. Great. Um, and how do you enhance human factors thinking when utilizing or following a known methodology like Taproot, where root causes are prescribed? Yeah, when following known methods. So we so we did. Um, yeah, when root causes are prescribed. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. We we used. Um, Taproot or something similar. We did use it for for a while. Um, I, I think it is tricky and it, and it is limiting when 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 you're looking at um, uh, either categories of different types of error or um, you know almost like underlying causes that are kind of written down for you again, put into categories. I think I think it is difficult. Um, you end up just labeling behaviours and it's kind of you, you find the best fit and, it, and it, sometimes it, it's not really a good fit. Um, the, the thing about the causal approach that we use is that there's there's none of that. There's no labelling. Um, it's just it's it's very descriptive. You know, you're describing um, what happened and why. So that the boxes that you saw there, um, it's about getting the right description in the box to for, for the behaviour or for the for the underlying cause, and, and and it's not, it's not trying to categorise that in any in any way. Categorisation would come later on once we've done the investigation, then where we it then gets put into our um, recorded in our system, and and then there is a piece where the categorisation comes in. But for the actual analysis discovery, we 
we stay away from categorization. And that kind of uh, leads on to the next question. Do you use categories for looking at trends? So I guess ultimately yeah. you would. Yeah, so so we do, yeah, so we do. But that that as I say, that comes after after we've done the investigation, um somebody will input that to our um incident management system. Uh, and then we can then sort of interrogate that and look and, and look for, for trends. Yeah. Um to show that we get caught up in debates in time whether it was intentional or unintentional. Yeah. So yeah, it's something that I I haven't really covered here, but um, unintentional. Sorry, no, I'm reading that wrong. It was intentional or unintentional? Um, we would we would certainly we would certainly consider that. Um, is it intentional or, or unintentional? And try and determine, you know, which which we think it was. Um, Again, just part of part of describing the behaviour. So, in the example I gave you there, we, um, you know, we were able to determine that yeah, the, the the technician, well, he intended to press the button, but he didn't intend for the arm that was full of propane to open. So, uh, if if you just describe it in that way, um, hopefully people can see which part was intentional and which part was unintentional. Um, and maybe just a, a couple more before we close. Um, do you see a systematic use of human factors investigation in all your investigations? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. So I would say um, with the bigger, more serious incidents, then we get more, you know, there's more um, probably HF input and there's more HF thinking. And in the smaller incidents probably less so um part of that is what time time spent on it part of it is um with the bigger investigations you get the more experienced investigators and vice versa so there is a kind of a sliding scale i think in in, in terms of how much how much and in, in the quality of the hf input um that's great i think we um We'll bring that to a close for today. Um, if you have any additional questions, um, please do put them in the chat function and we will um, take a transcript of them and have them answered and sent out to attendees. Um, thank you again to David for um, doing that presentation for us. It's always great to have sort of practical examples, uh, certainly for lay people like myself. Um, and just a reminder that um, Step Change in Safety's um, second quarterly theme of the year is on human factors and performance. So there is a lot more information available on our website, including um, downloadable resources. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we hope to share the presentation um, to attendees. Um, but if you have any um, additional comments, questions, or would like to contact us, um, don't hesitate to do that. Um, you can do that via the information on your screen at the moment. Otherwise, thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you for your time this morning. Thanks um, to David um, and have a great day. Take care now. Yeah, thanks everybody.